Thank you for tuning into this message online or on podcast format. We're so glad that you're able to hear the Word of God. Uh, We'd encourage you to also uh, get into the Word of God on a regular basis on your own. There's no substitute for reading the Word of God yourself. And so we'd encourage you to download a Bible app. Uh, In addition to that, uh, if you're not part of a local church body, we'd love for you to consider being a part of Christ Community Church. Or if you're not in our area, finding a gospel-centered, Uh, Bible-based church in your home area to be a part of. There's no substitute for real fellowship with the body of Christ. So we hope that you enjoy this message. We hope that it really blesses your life. And if you would like to support us financially, you can go to our website and do that as well so we can continue to spread, spread the gospel to those in the world around us. Have a great day. God bless you. How are we doing today? Better now that you can hear me. Welcome online. You can definitely hear me now. Uh, Got to unmute yourself sometimes and have your voice be heard. Anyways, good, good to be here with all of you. Today we are in a special one-time message called Growing What God Gave You. And so I think we would all agree that God has given us things in our lives. God's principle for that, though, is, is that we grow what he gave us. And so if you want to study Matthew chapter 25, uh, it explains to us the talents and, and multiplying them and what God's heart is for us to multiply what he's given us. And so here at Christ Community Church, we talk about growing what God gave us both as individuals and as a church and God is multiplying what he's doing here as a church and so some of those ways that we've seen it here they've just been somewhat immeasurable in some side of things uh, because of the way that God is is bringing new people all the time the reach that we've had in our community your friends and family some of you are here now who are bringing your friends and family uh, to church and to the Lord Uh, this year we're gonna see uh, very close to about a hundred people be baptized at Christ Community Church Uh, God is on the move uh, in and around right here in Christ Community Church. And those ages of people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're from uh, elementary school ages all the way up to the last kind of season of life, if you will, the best way we can say. We can clap about that. God is, is doing so, so much here, near, and far away. Uh, we're seeing leaders be raised up. Many of you have joined to be uh, community group apprentices or apprentice leaders in other area of ministry. We have, other, we have, uh, we have lay residencies right now. Uh, we have Yari as an intern. We're sending our very first missionary uh, to Africa in January, uh, Emily Leonard. And so as we see what God's doing, he's, he's multiplying what God has. We're also looking to continue to invest here in our physical plants, right here at East and at North. The North Campus, uh, back in September and October, they had a, a giving campaign called Making Room, and it was to add a classroom and a bathroom, a second first floor bathroom. There are others are in the basement if you haven't been there. It's a little, little creepy and down, downstairs, hard to get to. And so we're adding another bathroom, but we're also, we've turned a stage into a classroom, which is much needed space there, busting at the seams over there. That church, to remind those who are new in 2021, we were given that space to keep it as a church, to grow it, to have it be a vibrant ministry in that area of Taunton again. It went from having about 10 or 12 people to now just almost 200 people and 30 or 40 kids every week. Can we praise God for that? And they weren't waiting years and years and years to have their first baptism. They're baptizing people regularly there as well. Uh, But this financial campaign, our goal was for that campus specifically to raise $100,000 in seven or eight weeks was the length of the campaign. And they got almost there. They raised $75,000 in seven weeks. Praise God for that. Some of you here caught wind of that and you, you couldn't help but give to it. So praise God for you. And so we are going to, we, we maybe fell a little short financial, but we are going to finish the, pro, the project, and we're going to have more room. The, the classroom's already underway, being built. You could certainly stop by there, take a look, visit on a weekend, and go, go check that place out. Uh, but God is doing a work in us and through us in the area, in, in this area. Here's the other thing you can't really put a number on, but I think we can all feel it. 
Some of us have been here quite a long time. Many of us have been following Jesus for many, many years. Uh, but there's a new, fresh encounter that's happening spiritually through Christ Community Church in our lives. We're, we're coming to grips with some things that we've kind of buried for years. We're talking about deeper issues like forgiveness. We're talking about uh, deeper issues in relationship or knowing God more, trusting God more in those areas. Uh, we're seeing marriages being healed. We're seeing lives being changed. And many of us, the, the people that we're hearing testimonies from, they're like, man, I, I accepted God 20 or 30 years ago, but I'm, I'm finally starting to deal with this thing. And so God is doing a spiritual work here at Christ Community Church. Can we praise God for all that he's doing? And so looking ahead, our heart is, as a church, to be a training center, a training center that raises up both lay leaders, meaning that that's not their full-time vocation, all of us who are disciples and disciple makers in our everyday life, that would be a lay leader, uh, lay disciple makers, and also vocational leaders and pastors, we want to be a training center that in the next 10, 20 years, we're raising up this next generation of people who are going to go do what? And that is to grow what God gave them to multiply what God did and so part of that it includes you all of that actually I'm sorry includes you and it'll take all of us to do that and so we're going to continue to grow these things we're going to continue to expand our local and and national and global reach uh, as a church and so we know that if we stay the course if we continue to to get behind and grow what God's given us as a church to be a good steward that multiplication just starts taking off and so we are in a pre preparation time, in a prayer time, in a planning time. We believe that God has it, that we may plant another location or plant another independent church somewhere here in the future. We're in prayer about that. We're in discernment about that. We've partnered, many of you know, with another church, a meeting house in Middleborough, uh, at a location in Bridgewater. And so Monday nights, we have a community group there that meets with college-age kids. And Tuesday night, I'm running a disciple-making training uh, time for student age kids who want to reach people in their generation and, and not not only like invite them to church and those things but be able to reach them and then know how to disciple them and start groups and they're really like little micro churches in their dorms uh, in their workplaces in their neighborhoods and so we're doing that training already there and we don't know where God's going to take it but we're moving with God in that we're we're walking through whatever door he has and so as we consider where we're at as a church if you're wondering kind of where we're headed as a church we're headed to do continually do what we're doing but I know that as each one of us gets that gets that wind the spirit leading us to continue to multiply what God has given us to continue to grow what God has given us we're going to see this happen more and more and more. As each one of us individually seeks a deepening of our faith, we continually walk by faith in more and more areas of our life, you're going to see more and more multiplication of that. Because when there's growth, growth is contagious. And we're not, you haven't heard me yet even talk about numeric growth, right? I could say to you, hey, I believe that we're going to have you know, 2,000 people at this campus and 1,000 people at the North Campus in the next couple of years. We could say that. God might do that, but that's actually not our focus because we're more focused on the kingdom than we are our own castle. What I believe, though, on top of that, though, is, is that in the next 10 years, we, as just our church, not counting all the other awesome churches in the area that are getting after it for the gospel, but just our church, if you do the math, if each one of us get involved and jump on what God is doing, we can and will reach 10,000 people in the next 10 years for Jesus. Amen. And I'm not talking about dragging people from this church. I'm talking about people who right now in this moment do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior that are going to spend eternity separated from him. We know in our heart if we continue on the pace that we're on, on the course that we're on, and all of us do our part as God has called us to do, we will grow what God gave us. And what that will lead to is 10,000 more people in the kingdom of heaven. Do you believe that, church? Well, today's message, we're talking about, what, what, about growing what God gave us. Now, if you're new to Christ Community Church, if this is the first time you've tuned in online or walked in the door, you're like, oh, here we go again. Church talking about money. Well, listen, if you stay long enough, you know we're coming for everything, okay? We're talking about it all. You just haven't been here long enough. Look, we're trying to grow. Would you guys affirm that? Do we not talk about it all here at Christ Community Church? Yeah. And 
it hurt here first, okay? It hurts here first. It's something that we as pastors and elders and leaders, we do not preach things that we're not wrestling with and applying in our own life. And so today, the thing we're gonna talk about, the area of our life that we are gonna wrestle with and consider is the area of finances. We're gonna talk today about what God's given us financially and how he wants us to grow that in order to grow ourselves spiritually, but also he utilizes that to fuel kingdom growth. And so the two things are today. But I want you to remember this one thought today. When you walk out the doors today, I don't want you to think, oh, the pastor just wanted more money for me or money for me or or the message was about money. I want you to hear this one thing, and I don't want you to forget it. Giving is about faith, not finances. Giving is about faith, not finances. Could you say that out loud with me today, church? Giving is about faith, not finances. We're going to talk a lot about money today. We are gonna, you're going to hear us talk about money as the years go on here. And maybe you're wondering, why do we talk about money? Well, it was one of the top topics that Jesus talked about. And all throughout Scripture, money's in there. The reason is, is that Scripture says, Jesus himself says, is where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And, and you see, money can easily set itself up as God in our life. I would argue that it's probably the easiest thing that can be a false god in our life because it offers a lot of things kind of temporarily and really at a fictitious level of what God is wanting to offer us at an eternal level. Now, money does it temporarily, but God wants to do it eternally. So let's look at a few ways that, we, that this happens. So the first part is, is that money offers us temporary security. God gives us eternal security. Money offers us temporary security. Now, Matthew 6, 19 through 21, we're not going to look at all of these verses here today specifically, uh, but as we have those references, I want to encourage you to take a photo, uh, follow it along. The handout you got is also kind of a guide to the message today, and so we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit. But the truth is, whether it's the hope for money that I, that I don't have, or the money I do have, I find security in that money. And I think if I just had more, I would feel more secure in life. Are you guys with me here today? Do you agree with that statement? Money gives us some sense of security. Would you guys agree? Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure we're, we're, you haven't tuned out on me yet. Let's go to the next one. Money uh, gives us a couple of things here as well. And so money gives us comfort and convenience. God gives us comfort and peace. Think about that. Money affords comfort, but the real comfort we need is from the Lord. In fact, if you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, God is the God of all comfort and the God of all compassion who comforts us in our time of need so that even while we're going through a difficult time, we can comfort others, not with our own comfort, but with the comfort that we receive from the Lord. God is our great comforter, but money easily sets it up. Uh, that we can find comfort in that. Now, we know that money's important, but it's only a tool in our life. It's not to be set up as the God of our life or as the place of comfort. God is offering us true comfort and true peace, and we're going to continue to talk about that here today. Money uh, gives us uh, dependence on wealth, and so money says, hey, you got to be dependent on your wealth, and so the more we look at what that looks like and, and forecasting what we feel like we need. And I don't know about you, uh, but I end every year. Now, I've had years of plenty. I've had years of not a lot. Uh, but what I find out is at the end of the year, uh, regardless of what my income was, I always just had enough. Amen. I always just had enough. Many, many, many years ago, my wife Wendy and I, I used to get paid straight commissions. And so... I would take what they call a draw every week against my sales. It was a minimal draw, like enough to buy groceries and gas. And at the end of the month, you got the rest of your money, and they would deduct what you took so far. You guys with me on that math so far? And so let's just say I'd get a couple of thousand dollars in, in the bank uh, for that end of the month after taxes. I'd go through and pay my rent and pay my electric and pay my car payment or, and my motorcycle payment. And then I'd, use, I'd think about how much money I need to keep taking Wendy out to dinner and buy her flowers because I you know, was just pre-marriage. So I was trying to woo her still. And so I would go through all of that and I'd get to the very end of the month. And most often there was a negative at the end of the month. There was more month than there was money. Anybody feel me in the room? 
Sometimes I still have more month than there is money. It's just how it is. But if there was something left, I'd give God a little something. If there wasn't, I wouldn't. And then I remember my sister talking to me, my older sister. She goes, Matt, that's not how that principle works. I go, I know, Teresa. She goes, no, no, no. You've got to move that gift, the, the giving, to the top of the line and then figure out your bills after that. And you know what? That was a game changer for our life. And we've had to hustle. Um, I didn't initially go to college. I worked tons of hours in the car business. That's feast or famine. Anyone that's in sales, you know how it goes. Uh, it's feast or famine. And so, but we made it. You can tell I haven't missed a meal in a lot of years, right? You're with me. I, my body affirms that. But either way, we went through some really difficult times. In fact, in my entrepreneurial nature, I was always good at sales, but I thought, hey, it'd be a really good idea to open my own car dealership. I opened that dealership. I owned it for two years. I bought a bigger house in the process because, you know, if your income goes up, you need to increase your standard of living. Yeah, I needed that bigger house. Oh, yeah. And so real bright, I, I kept one and, and bought the other one while I hadn't, before I sold the other one. So we had two mortgages on two houses. I wasn't only living in one of them. And so then we were attempting to sell the other one, and it was a mess. But then business went south. And so we lost the house. We lost a couple hundred thousand dollars of our own money. We wrote off $1.5 million in debt. Now, this is back in 06, so I don't know. That's probably $2 million today. At least it feels like it. We had nothing. I had a broke 1999 Ford Windstar and like $100 to our name. That's all we had. We had to get some help from family. We had nothing. But you know what we did through that whole time? Any single dollar that came into the house, we gave on that. Because God was faithful. We made it. We had another home to live in. We had another job. We had income. We were able to make it. That 99 Ford Windstar lasted as long as it needed to last. And that's all it lasted. But it lasted. And so every dollar that we came in, we had moved to a place. And God's, God's, our heart was, was we fully believe, and we still do to this day, that everything we got was from God. And so we gave on the first portion, not the last portion. By giving on the first portion, we were able to realize that God gave us this money and God wants us to give back to him as acknowledgement to that, but not just to give a token, but to be generous about it, to say, God, look, you, you were with me in the valley, you've been with me on the mountaintop, you're with me in the years where there's, I feel like there's tons of money extra, but then I spend it all and then I just have enough anyways, and then the years I have nothing, I just have enough anyways. And so we're going to give them that first part. And so when we look at this dependence on wealth, look, it doesn't matter what money you have right now, you will not have it when you die. Your spouse will have it, your kids will have it, the government will have it, the nursing home will have it, somebody will have it, okay? But you're not going to have it. We treat money like we're, the, like we're a, a reservoir that we get to store it up, and God intended our wealth actually to be us as just a conduit, a river. It flows through us. Now, if you think about the water in the banks of a river, what does it do? It nourishes and gives life to everything that it flows through. You get the benefit of the flow of the river. Some of us have like a little teeny stream that trickles through. Some of us have like, you know, the Mississippi River flowing through our life financially, but it's just going to flow through. You can't hold it. You can't store it up. But at the same time, it brings life to everything it flows through, doesn't it? Uh, there, there's fish swimming. There's trees that are growing. There's all kinds of things that are growing, and it gives life. It's green, and it's lush. And, and as we do that, but you know what happens to water if you store it up, right? If there's no water flowing through a body of water, it becomes stagnant and stale. And guess what else kind of happens? It's interesting because there's nothing feeding it now. It evaporates. And so the more you grow what God gave you, the more he's going to flow through your life and the more life is going to come from it. But also the life on the other end of that river just continues to be benefited as well. It wasn't yours to begin with. So don't put your dependence on wealth. Put your dependence on your faith in God. Money. Builds up an external appearance. God wants us to have eternal transformation. Money tells us that we can look a certain way. We can impress certain people. We can, we can live a certain way. Social media is probably the worst thing. Commercials were bad enough back in the day. I, you know, I, I just, every art car ad that came on, you're like, I need a new car. I need a new house. Now, literally the thing you just bought is out of style or there's something a little bit better, Right? You buy a rake and you're like, oh, this rake, it's the best new rake. It's lighter, it's wider, it's faster. But no, now there's a double tine rake and you need a double tine rake because that double, oh, this rake's no good anymore. We'll throw that away. Let me buy that $100 rake. Oh, wait, 
you mean there's a, there's a rake now that's Bluetooth that rakes for me? It's just like out there, like, <laughs> really? Oh, that's a thousand bucks? Oh, honey, I gotta have this. This is like the, no. Here's the other part is, is that you can spend money on all kinds of other things. Your clothing, your vacations, your appearances. And so it, it all leads to an appearance. It's a lifestyle image that we're trying to portray to the world around us. If you think about it, why do you look in the mirror? You're not looking at yourself walking through life all day. You want to make sure you look presentable. And some of that, I believe, is okay. But at the end of the day, we should really just be deciding, hey, are we covered appropriately? Do we have a booger hanging from our nose? Do I need to shave? Did I brush my teeth? Like, am I presentable to be in community with another human being right now? Or am I trying to make myself look like someone who I'm not? You hear me, church? Are you with me today? Money does that, though. Money says, oh, you got that. You can be who you want to be because you got the money to do it. Oh, I'm a little wrinkly here. I'm going to get an injection. I'm going to do all these things. I'm just embracing wrinkles and gray hair, by the way. It's good. They say it's a crown of wisdom, but I feel anyways. We're moving on. I got all kinds of thoughts there. Here's one more. Money offers pleasures of earth. God gives us the treasures of heaven. You see, this is where faith comes in, though. Yes, I want you to go on vacations. I love going to sandy, warm places where I can sit by the water. I want all that. We want to enjoy good food and enjoy the pleasures of life. God wants you to enjoy your life. Turn to the person beside you and say, enjoy your life. God wants you to enjoy your life. But Scripture also says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and many people have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Not pains, pangs. Look it up. I never really understood what it meant, but you can understand it as pains. We've pierced ourselves with these things. You fill your life with too many pleasures, it pulls you away from the, from, from the God who gave you the ability to go have all those pleasures, guys. Think about it for a moment. Pleasure is good. But if we're just trying to pain avoid and, and pursue pleasure, are we really grown in our faith? Have we been stretched at all? If every time we get more money, we're like, hey, I can go now on a second, third, or fourth vacation. I can buy a, a toy. I can do this. I can do that. If our focus is, is that we're always just going to increase our, our level of, of living, and our first inclination is and in say, God, what do you want me to do with this money? How do you want me to use this money? He might want you to buy that boat. You, you might be perfectly fine with that because you've been generous and, and, and willing to share first before all things. And he might say, hey, buy the boat. It might be perfectly fine. It might be a neutral thing. But if we're just Jones and just kick and scratch and do everything we possibly can, I know I always pick on boats around here. It's because maybe secretly I want a better one than I have, but it's all good. I paid 800 bucks for the thing seven years ago. It does the job. But here's the thing I want you to consider here today, church. Money, it's, it's not about finances, it's about faith. Where are we putting our faith in? When all the pleasures go away, when the money dries up, when we don't have all the things that we used to have, where's our faith at at that point? Where's our faith at in that point? The last one that's not up there is this. I shared this a little bit last week in the message about pleasing God. But too often, maybe it's not pleasures that you can put a dollar amount on, like motorcycles and all those extra things and all that stuff. Maybe it's date nights every week, whatever the case may be. I believe in date night, but six nights a week, let's be honest, we could be utilizing those funds for the kingdom somewhere else. It's excessive, right? But here's what I do know. Money at the minimum. Maybe you're here today and you're like, money is not an idol in my life. Money is just a tool, and I believe that about many, 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 many of you here in the room. I will say this, though, and I don't believe money's an idol in my life, but it's definitely a distraction. The things that money can buy me, that stupid cell phone that's in my hand, all of those things can distract us from what God wants for our life, and so I want you to wrestle with that here today, because this message is about faith, not about finances. And you're going to hear the word money like a dozen more times today, but I want you to hear it. Where is my faith in relation to my finances? I feel as though, as your pastor, I can talk about almost any topic there is. But when I talk about money, someone quits the team. Someone, want someone online, here, next service, North Campus, someone's going to send me an email and go, I can't believe you guys talked about money. Look, we care deeply for your soul 
We care deeply about your spiritual growth, and we know money easily sets itself up against what God wants for you. You with me here today, church? Here's what God wants for you. Would you stand with me and read here this morning? We're in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 13. I think many, many, many of you have heard 6 through 7 probably, but we're going to go through 13 because I want to show you something else. I want to show you what's on the other end of this river that flows through your life called money. I want to show you what's on the other end because when you grab a hold of that, when you see what God really intends for you to do with the finances that he's given you, whether it's a little teeny bit of finances or an abundant amount, Man, there's some stuff at the other end of that river that is beyond our imagination, and we should all want to go there in our life. So let's read out loud together. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way. I want to pause here just for a second. We're going to start back here at 11. This is the other end of the river, everybody. God's painting you a picture right here that if you allow yourself to be a conduit for what he wants, if you allow yourself to have the faith to grow what he's given you, there's a huge end of the river here. So let's start again. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. We're going to unpack this here in a minute. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. God, I pray, Lord, that you would do a work in our hearts here today, God. My heart, everyone else here, God, may we come to you and ask you first before all things on what you want us to do with what you gave us, God. Lord, today we're talking about finances, but God, may we ask that question in all areas of our life, God, in relationships, in our vocation, in our neighborhoods, with the abilities, the gifts, the talents, the spiritual gifts you've given us, God. Lord, would you uh, just move our hearts to to come to you and align our hearts with you and your word before all other things in this world, God. Lord, I know that this can be a sensitive topic for us. I know, God, that many of us um, just feel like we're doing great in this area, Lord, but we haven't really thought about it or looked at it or prayed much about it in many years. We've just kind of set it on autopilot, God. And Lord, I pray that you'd work in our hearts to consider what is it that you want us to do. God, I pray for those, Lord, uh, in between, Lord, in different areas of this, God, that you would move us to that next step in our faith, God. Those of us, Lord, that have kind of set up money as an idol in our life, I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you illuminate our hearts and minds in this time here today. God, many of us in the room are new today or new to church, and this whole idea of money kind of blindsiding us even here today. Uh, But God, may we just hear, each of us hear that it's about faith. It's about taking that trust step in you. The same way we've trusted our life to you as Savior and Lord, may we trust to you everything that you've given us, God, including finances. God, we believe that your word is fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, that it's written without error, and we hold it as the authority in our life, God. And Lord, we hold it as the authority in our life, even in the areas that we don't feel comfortable or fully convinced yet, God. May we step out in faith in those areas, especially, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. 
So as you look at this passage, you can see that there's four things. And Will did a great job today at the welcome, and and he shared those four things. You're going to hear those regularly here, okay? And it's not just something we came up with. Believe it or not, it's actually from the Word of God. Could you believe that? That was supposed to be kind of a sarcastic joke. Okay. But we believe four things. That we are called by God as followers of Jesus Christ to give prayerfully, regularly, cheerfully, and generously. Can you say those four with me? Prayerfully, regularly, cheerfully, and generously. Those are the four ways we're called. If we look at this passage today, he tells us that we should give cheerfully in our heart what we've decided to give. Now, this isn't us going home and saying, what can we give? This is us actually considering in our heart. When we talk about our heart, the Bible is talking about the place where our intellect, our soul, our relationship, of course, that's where the Holy Spirit lives. Uh, This is our entire being. This is the part of our life that makes us human in relation to animals, okay? That's That's our soul. It's our very being. It's our intellect, our conscience. It's our morality. It's that guide that the Holy Spirit is pushing as he's pushing our heart or our soul. And so when when it says to give what you've decided in your heart, it's not just what you've decided to give in your head. So God wants us to come to him prayerfully and honestly and say, God, I know you've called me to do this. And even if it's a struggle, maybe maybe you've just had bad experiences in churches and how they've talked about giving or money, or or maybe you've been in a place of struggle. Whatever the case may be, whatever you're Whatever place you're coming to this in, what we're asking is, as we try and lead you to a deeper place with the Lord, is to just do it prayerfully. You don't have to have the conversation with us, but you owe it to yourself to talk to God about it, but in a place of your heart, not just your intellect, and not just out of human logic, but with the Lord. And so then we can move to a place where this is what I've decided to do in my heart. And so the next part is, in in another passage, it tells us in 2 Corinthians 2, to give, to to set apart weekly before the offering comes around, to to decide and then set apart weekly what that offering is and to be ready to give it when the collection is made. And so that regularly part is huge. And so that regularly part means that, hey, every time income comes into the house, I'm going to give regularly. Some of you get paid once a month. Some of you have a business. And so you're not, you haven't paid yourself in in, in months, I don't know how that always works or where you're at in that, but as income comes into your, your, your possession, that we give it and we do it regularly or consistently, I think is how you can read that. Uh, but God wants us to do it regularly, just like we need to worship every day. We need to worship on the weekend with so many things in our faith that we know we need to do regularly, like reading our Bible. Remember how many times a week we got to read it for transformation? Anybody? Four, Four or more. Four is a minimum, but now I'm just messing with you. No, no, four or more. Uh, but those are those regular things. And so when it comes to finances, we got to think, oh, no, this is a regular thing I'm going to do. A great way to do it regularly, Wendy and I do it this way uh, with a portion of our income and then other income that's more sporadic, we decide as we go and, and give a check. But we set it up online. You can go online if you get paid like a, a consistent weekly or every other week thing and just have it come out auto withdrawal. Here's what I learned about auto withdrawal for all of my friends in the, in, the, in the room that do auto withdrawal is, as I've been preparing and talking about generosity more this year, I'm doing my own self-examination and I realized that, you know what, I've just been living on whatever it is after that number and it's kind of automatic and I've actually haven't prayed as much about that number as I would have if I was writing the check personally every week. Now, With that said, I'm not going to stop giving automatically, but what I did was I stopped and prayed and said, God, is this still the amount that you want me to give, okay? And so scripture says to not let the right hand know what the left hand is doing, and so I'm not going to tell you amounts, but to encourage you, God convicted me to say, yeah, you know what, you need to to bump that up a little bit. And that little bit hurt a little bit. (laughs) And when God tells us to do something in our faith, it should hurt just a little bit. Right, Eric? should hurt just a little bit. If he's going to do something in our faith, it should hurt just a little But when we think about regularly, it's that consistency. You know, your faith doesn't always just grow like that. Sometimes the chains will fall off. We've got stories in the room like that. But really, transformation happens with small choices a little bit over time. That's how we get renewed in our spirit and our mind. You're not going to learn the whole uh, you know, whole word of God in a week, you're going to do it a little bit over time. And that's how transformation happens. But also, that's why God wants us to do it a little bit over time. By the way, 
If you feel like you don't have a generous spirit or this is a big issue in your life, I would encourage you to do this consistently over time and see what God does in your life, in your heart towards finances. See what he does in abundance, which I'm telling the next part of the message ahead of time. So let me move back to cheerfully. Here's the other part. If you're about to give a gift and you feel like it was done out of pressure, if it was done out of guilt, some of us in the room are like, oh my gosh, I sinned a whole lot. Let me write a big check this week and see if I can... We don't do that in this church, okay? That's not the word of God, all right? You should always give because you sought the Lord, you looked over your finances, you asked God what the number was, and maybe the number that you had decided on your own is the right number. That might be true. You might be in alignment already, but you owe it to yourself to ask God to do it. But then at that point, you should be able to have a good attitude about doing it. If you don't, you've got to ask yourself why. I don't care if you're showing up to serve someplace, if you're going to your community, if you've got a bad attitude walking into church on a Sunday morning and you don't know why you have a bad attitude, it's not some other external thing, ask yourself why. God wants you to follow him cheerfully with delight. Even in the darkest of moments, we can say, yeah, this moment's really terrible. This is awful, this stage of life. But I have joy, I'm cheerful about who I am in Christ. Amen, everybody? <laughs> And so we need to do it cheerfully. So whatever that gift is, God loves a cheerful gift. He loves a cheerful giver. In fact, if we're doing it reluctantly, it's not actually a, 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 an act of worship according to the word of God. Did you hear that? So if you're doing it without the heart of cheerfulness, without that kind of heart of generosity where you've asked God to do it, it's not an act of worship before God. It's a nice thing. It's a good thing. But it's actually not that heartfelt act of worship that he's looking for. It's not just in finances, in every area of life. If you're serving and you don't have a cheerful heart of why you're doing it, it's now no longer the act of worship that God is looking for. He wants us to do it with a humble and contrite heart before him. Lastly is generously. Look, generously, uh, as we think about that word, God wants us to be generous like he is to us. So we give these four things. Let's say it again prayerfully, regularly, cheerfully, and generously. And I know you know most of that. I want to show you, though, in this passage here today, what God's promises are. And so take a look at what, as we allow finances in our life to be a river that flows through, what happens at the other end of the river. First off, that, that river gets wider, right? That river gets wider, and he says in his word, he's going to bless you abundantly. Someone say the word, abundantly. He's going to bless you abundantly. Now, I'm not here to tell you that you're going to be, you know, driving Rolls Royces and, 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 you know, buying mansions and all that kind of stuff. Maybe that's what God wants you to do, but you best be riding someone along in that Rolls Royce that's, uh, you know, needs a ride, okay? Maybe you go do free Uber with it or something, but either way, you should be using all you have for the Lord, but he will bless you abundantly. But we're going to see what the definition of abundantly blessed is. I will say this. If you, in your whole heart, with faith, continue to give to God regularly before you give to anything else, you will find a peace in your finances that surpasses all understanding. That's my guarantee to you. Will you get more money coming into your account? I don't know, but the blessings will be abundant because you're just going to see other things pop. And if it's been an issue in your life, you need to know that it's a blockade in the growth uh, in your relationship with Jesus, and this is the one that probably needs to be focused on. If this message right now, you've shut your brain off, you're scrolling something else on your phone, you're like, I don't want to hear it, this message is likely for you. It just is. Sorry to say, but God wants to remove any barrier between him and you. He sent Jesus to do it. He died on the cross for your sins, and now he's saying we have to willingly say, yeah, let's address this barrier now. This is the one we're talking about. He wants to bless you abundantly, though. You're missing out on the abundant blessing of God by not giving to him generously, regularly, cheerfully, and faithfully. Uh, you will abound in every good work. Look at this. His blessing of the good work that he wants us to do. You're going to not just be able to go do it. Terry, what did he say? What's the word? Say it out loud for the people in the back. You'll abound. I caught you, buddy. You are eyes on. He says, no, you won't be able to just complete it. You're going to abound. Say abound with me, church. Come on. Abound. You're going to abound in every good work. God says, hey, you do this thing. It's really a small thing when we think about it. He, keep, he lets us keep the majority of what he gives us. But he says, because of this, you're going to be blessed abundantly and you're going to abound in every good work. I don't know about you. I'd love to not just get it done. I want to abound in it. Amen? Amen. I want to abound. I want to be like Tigger and bounding everywhere I go. No, no, sorry. 
No, some people in the room don't even know who Tigger is. Anyways. <laughs> Look at this. He enlarges the harvest of your righteousness. What? God wants to grow us in holiness and righteousness. And so by being faithful in this area, he says, hey, as you go through this, as you follow me in faith in this area of your life, I am going to enlarge, that's your river getting bigger, the harvest of your righteousness. There'll be more of my righteousness flowing through you is that harvest. It's going to pour out on more people in your life. You're like, I want people to know that I'm a believer, but I don't want to go knocky-knocky on doors and wearing crazy t-shirts to tell them. I just want them to know. You're going to, you're going to grow in righteousness, and that word harvest is huge because there's a harvest that comes with your faithfulness, and it's a harvest of righteousness in you and in the world around you. Praise God for that. He will enrich you in every way. We're going to talk about what that is. He then goes in further detail here. So you can be generous on every occasion. Look at this. The more we're generous, the more he gives us the ability to be more generous. And I know I'm looking at a group of people that I know experience that. You know the more you give, it just comes back to you. You know, and it's not like a bad penny. It's like a good $100 bill. It just keeps coming back. You just can't get rid of the thing. I can't tell you how many times that's happened in my life. We're like, ah, let's just give it. And then before you know it, stuff just shows up again. And you're like, oh, okay, that's how that works. But God wants to continually uh, give you and be more generous to you so that you can be more generous to others. Some of us, our river is small because we haven't been thinking big enough. We've been thinking that's the river that God gave us and he doesn't want us to have a bigger river. It might not be bigger financially, but if it's bigger in righteousness and abounding in every good work and that we can be maybe generous in other ways, the more we do that. But it starts with saying, okay, God, I'm going to just take out this, this bit of this river before it goes. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to pass it down before I try and drink and keep all that. And God says, well, you do that. I'm going to keep widening your river and widening your river and widening your river so you can flow more to other people. That sounds like a pretty amazing concept to me. Amen? Amen. He'll supply... Oh, uh, this is a cool one. This will result in others giving thanksgiving to God. That part's not part of the verse, but what, what this really defines is it's contagious generosity. The passage says that in our generosity, in our, our faithfulness, in our giving, others give thanks to God because of what we did. They may never know who you are. They may never know who you are. You know, recently we've, we've helped a few people in a really difficult spot through the CARE Fund. We've helped people, and we'll show some more stuff uh, through Generosity Week, and I've gone to these places and met people, and you'll see one video and a couple more videos next week for some being reported back. The monies that you're given to Christ Community Church, there's people that are giving thanks to God because of your generosity, and you likely will never meet them, and, and I'm not going to tell you who they are, so you won't even know who they are. You won't know who they are until you get to heaven. I have to be okay with that, and so do you. But people are giving thanks to God because of your generosity. That's pretty powerful. Imagine your giving unlocks someone's pausing and giving thanks to God. They're acknowledging God. Some haven't acknowledged God in their whole life, but because it came through you and through the church, they go, wait a second, maybe God is real because, boy, I was in this tough place of need, and you guys showed up just on time with the right amount of dimes, and I'm here. Like, praise the Lord. And I've seen it over and over and over again. And so look at that. People will, will thank God because of that. Then he says again. He says it again as another promise. He's not just going to continue to be generous to you more, but he's also going to supply all your needs and overflow in countless other ways. Here's a big issue with us. We go, well, if I give this, oh, man, I, it might be the last amount of money I have. Or if I go out and step out in this generous, you know, uh, my, my, I might lose my job or, or I might get sick or I might have an emergency or this or that or this or that or this. No, see, this is why it's not about finance. It's about faith. It's faith to say, God called me to do this with what he gave me and I'm trusting God that he will supply all of my needs. Philippians 2 would say that he'll supply all of your needs according to his glorious riches. That's more than the entire wealth in the whole world is what God has. And he says, by that standard, I will, apply, I will supply for all of your needs. That's what God's promises to us. And so that's what that faith thing is. Like, man, God, this is the last like, $100 of spending money I got. 
but you've called me to give it. Uh, that's that faith moment right there. That stretch to say, okay, this is what I got. Maybe you've sold a property and you've made all kinds of hundreds of thousands of dollars on it and you haven't even thought about the fact that, wait a second, God gave me that profit. God, what do you want me to do with it? Now you want to talk about a stretch. Forget about the real estate commission and the closing costs. You go, oh, wow, that's bigger than any of those. But uh, all right, God, you gave it to me. I'm going to trust you on the other end of it. It gets real, doesn't it? It gets real. Others will praise God because of your obedience. We talked about this earlier, but we see it again. When Scripture repeats something, we've got to take notice that through you, through our generosity, doing it cheerfully and prayerfully and regularly and generously, that, that others will again praise God because of our obedience. This is what God wants for you. And if we're not walking in this way, if we've got a hard heart towards it, it's you It's you who suffers. It's you who misses out on what God has a plan for you because it is abundant, amen? He wants your river to be widened. He wants to to have you have a view and a passion and a desire for all the kingdom things that happen as you allow your income and your resources and all that God's given you to flow through you and not just to come to you, to be held by you, but to be utilized for his kingdom. Here's a freebie. Even your spiritual gifts were given to you, but they weren't given to you for you. They were given to you so that by you, you could bless somebody else. It's God's principle. He gives us a whole lot, but he wants us to give it away. Here's the other thing that generosity does is it flies in the face of self-centeredness. Last week, we had 10 things that kind of show that we're self-centered. We're unable to be truly generous and self-centered at the same time. And so if you're still wrestling with last week's message on being self-centered, I think we all are at some level because we're human and we have a sin nature, but we can't be self-centered and be generous at the same time. Those two things conflict. And so this is where this faith step comes in. We hold it here and we begin to be in that spot of difficulty. We begin to be in that spot of decision. And we're making a decision basically to what we want, between what we want and what God wants. That space in between is faith. And God wants us to just take a step of faith and a step of faith. And how much faith do we have and to have to have in order to move mountains is what Scripture says. Any Bible knowers in the room? How much faith do we have? Just a little teeny bit of faith. Turn to the person beside you like this, go teeny bit. It's just a teeny bit of faith. He's only actually asking us for to give faithfully a portion of our income. He's not telling you to write the whole check for all you got. He says, have a little bit of faith here. Trust me that I'm going to do it again. Step out and do it. But when we've got plans, I want to put that addition on. I want that kid thing. I want all those type of things, like all these things, right? We put all that before God. We're making an idol out of money and out of ourselves and not worshiping God as God. And that's where faith comes in. And we've got to put God first. I, first. I will guarantee you, your life will be perfectly awesome. Some of those things may not happen because you put God first but some way more abundant and beautiful, wonderful kingdom things are going to happen because you did. Amen? Amen. Acts 20, 35 says this, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, you must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. It is more blessed to give than receive. We, I am just in love with being the pastor here at Christ Community Church. I don't want to pastor anywhere else. My goal, as long as it's the Lord's goal, is to be here until I retire. I'm not, I I don't, if someone offered me to pastor somewhere else, I wouldn't take it. I want to pastor here because I love all of you. Those of you that I just met for the first time, I'm here because I love you and I love people. And so I want you to meet, I want you to hear this next statement with love. Receiving is really good. It's a blessing to receive. Would you guys agree? Like, we're blessed with all we receive. We receive salvation through Christ Jesus. His church, this is just one expression, but this is the one we're in. So we're going to talk about this one, but I mean universally. The church, though, gives us a whole lot of blessing. Would you guys agree? Weekend worship services, uh, community groups. We think about how it helps us to raise our kids in the Lord. We think about how it helps us in, 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 all, in all of life, from, from cradle to grave, as some churches would say, is, is that we receive these rich blessings uh, from the Lord. It helps us to grow spiritually. There's accountability. You basically have all the resources of the church as being a part of the church 
on call 24 hours a day as a helpline, whether it's your community group leader or one of the pastors, but like we're in this together because you come once you're a visitor, you come twice, you are family. And so we've received a whole lot. And he's saying that it's a blessing to receive. It is a blessing to receive. Would you guys agree? What I would argue, though, is in our consumer culture, we haven't put off the receiving thing enough, and we've only taken the little blessing of receiving, and we haven't experienced the giant blessing of giving. In fact, I'd argue that many of us in the room have been receiving for a whole lot of years. We've been receiving all kinds of things, both spiritually, relationally, emotionally. Gosh, think about it. We've met our spouses here. We've had kids here. We've met customers here, we've gotten jobs here, like you name it, we've got it, and it mostly happened through the network of God's body. Maybe not just this church, but it's happened through the network of believers. You feel me so far? But we've received a whole lot, but in relation to what we've received, we actually haven't given. And so it's time for many of us in the room to move from being a a, a taker or a receiver and be a giver. I'm not saying it's wrong to receive. I'm glad you're here receiving. Many of us are in a season where we're just in a place where all we can do is receive. We want you here, amen, church? We're here to give to you. We can't give if there aren't some people who need to receive. But eventually, we need to move from saying, hey, I've received all of these things, and I've received all kinds of multitude of financial blessing in my life, but am I, is it more blessed to keep, or is it more blessed to give? What this passage is, Jesus' words himself, he says it's more blessed. Yes, you've been blessed. Yes, you've been given all these things, but way more blessings are on the other side. If you take a big portion of what you've done generously, pray about it, and give it, there's way bigger blessings on the other side. Amen? And this is what God wants for you, not necessarily from you. This is what God is asking. Giving is about faith and not finances. So here's where we're going to land the plane here today, because we've got a plan for this. You guys got your hand out on the way in? And so I want you to think about this. As a church, we've celebrated Generosity Weekend for the last four years. I'm going to give you an update on that. That's a new thing that we put in place four years ago. The first year, uh, we raised $60,000 in one weekend, and I'll tell you how we did it and what what kind of the... I hate to call it a challenge, but kind of the spiritual challenge is to call to say, hey, let's take a step out in faith. We'll explain that in a moment. It was 60,000. The previous, the year after that was 45,000. And then we had a 70,000. I'm sorry, last year was the third year. This will be the fourth year. My apologies, that that looks uh, a little different. This will be the fourth year we've done it. Last year, $98,000 came in on one weekend. 60, 45. Did you hear $98,000? Somebody. And so coming up, November 17th, this gives us two weeks to prepare our hearts before the Lord. It also, those of us that get paid every other week, it hopefully hits that cycle. Because as your pastor, I just want you to take a step of faith and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I don't know where the message hit you today, but we're going to do this. And so As we think about this coming forward, we're going to have another giving weekend. And so here's what I don't want. I don't want to walk around the sanctuary and find these laying in the seats everywhere or see them in the trash here. If you're going to throw it away, just humor me. Take it home. Throw it away in your own house. Please. Okay? Be a good steward. It's nicely printed and well done. Look, Take it home and pray over it. If you have prayed over this and said, God, what is it that you want from me in this area of my life? And he says, nope, you're doing it just right. Or if you're in a place you're like, nope, I'm not ready to give cheerfully, then don't do it. I want you to hear that. And I want you to walk back in the door because I won't know either way. I want you to walk back in the door, okay, and, and have your head held high. But what my ask is, is that have you had a conversation with God about this particular topic? I want to bring us back to the latter, and then we're going to close in a prayer here today on how to do this. So if you remember the ladder from the spring is, is that many of us in the room are in a place where we need to begin to be an initial giver. We're just going to start to give, and it's going to be that first time gift or that first time where we're given kind of regularly, but we're we're given something. And so that's the initial gift. You don't climb a ladder starting at the top rung. Would you guys agree? Most often, unless you're my height, then you can usually start at like the third rung. 
but the next one is intentional. You're saying, yeah, you know what, I'm going to do this kind of more consistently. And then we move to proportional. Many of us believe that it's a tithe. Some of us try and increase our tithe every year. Some of us start and say, hey, God put on my heart to start at 5% but increase over the years. And so that's a proportional to our income. The next part is faithful. We're in a place where we're, we've decided what we're going to give. Uh, we realize that it's God's money, and we're now trying to grow that gift. We want our, our, our river to enlarge every year, and we're giving more and more. And then fearless is like every single thing I have is God. I'm taking up the challenge. I'm going to try and outgive God. He says I can't. I'm going to prove him wrong. But your businesses and your rental properties and your income from your jobs and all of those things, you say, hey, I'm storing all of this up, and the more God gives me, the more I'm going to give back. I've decided what I can live on, what I need for retirement, and anything else beyond that is going to go to the kingdom. Here at Christ Community Church and other great kingdom places to give around the globe, that's what fearless giving is. This is what we're asking for you on November 17th, though. I'm going to contradict what I just said. I want you to start on the top rung of the ladder. I want for one week for you to be a fearless giver. I want for one week for you to look at your, your, your weekly income and say, okay, God, what do you want me to give? If it doesn't hurt a little bit, it might not be the right number, but I want you to take that trust step. What would be a faith gift? Not just an easy gift, but what would be faith? What number is it that I'm gonna give that would be a step of faith in the right direction towards God? What is that number? Now, some of us in the room, we've been given faithfully, and we've been given a long time, but I also want you to look at the number for on November 17th and say, God, what extra do you want me to give? There's, there's tithes and then there's offerings. Offerings are over and above that. And so you may be an initial giver, you may be a fearless giver already, but what I'm asking you to do is pray about, God, how much more or how much for the first time ever do you want me to give on November 17th? Here's what I believe, church, and I'm not big on making predictions, but based on the traction of where we're at as a church, both spiritually and just in the regular growth, I believe that $150,000 can come in on November 17th. Now, I might be wrong. We're going to celebrate if it's 75. We're going to celebrate if it's 275. We're really going to celebrate if it's 275. No, no. We're going to celebrate whatever comes in. What we're really going to celebrate is people making a faith gift, moving forward in their faith. That's what we celebrate here at Christ Community Church. Amen? We celebrate people growing in their faith, coming out of darkness into the light. But my ask to you is, is to take this home, to read it over a few times, keep it somewhere obvious, talk about it with your spouse. I get that some of you, your spouse isn't saved, and so it kind of hems you into what you can give within what's within reason in your own home. Ask God, what is it that I can give without kind of starting a feud uh, in my relationship uh, with my husband or wife? You're with me on that, those that are married to a non-believer. I understand. I want you to be there, okay? But the ask is to give it. And here's what we're going to do with the money. And so we put it in there so you can read this. If you didn't catch it, we put all the important parts of this message in there for today. Here's what we're going to do with the money. Every dollar... Uh, over what we need weekly. So years past, we did 10% of it. We did 20% of it. Last year, we did uh, 50% of it, but then it came in so well, we actually gave 50,000 of it away. And so whatever we need over our weekly needed giving will go to outside ministries with one caveat. We're gonna take some of it to finish the project at North, which I think is fitting because we're also reaching people in that area. And so we're gonna move some of that there. But we wanna be wide open and honest to what we're doing with the funds. It's all going into the kingdom. We vet everybody that we give income to, okay? And so here, near, and far away is what we're doing. I've got a video for you, and then we're gonna celebrate, we're gonna pray and celebrate communion here today. Hey, Pastor Matt, Christ Community Church. David here with TTI, one of your missionaries. We plant churches together, primarily among unreached people groups. It's been our most fruitful year ever with a new church started every 13 minutes. And you guys are a major part of that. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for caring about people who don't know about Jesus, not only far ends of the earth, but also right there at home. You guys take the Great Commission seriously, and I'm honored to be on your team. Thank you for your generosity. God bless you. So let's, let's read this prayer on the bottom of the page. It'll be on your screen as well. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings. As I consider how much to give on Generosity Weekend, please show me what you want me to give, 
I want my gift to be an act of faith in you. May my giving be an act of worship, bringing glory to your name and drawing me closer to you. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion, I want us to consider the generosity of God today. I want you to just consider what he did. He gave up everything so that we could in turn have everything as well. And so as we consider communion here at Christ Community Church, we practice what's called an open communion. That means that if you said yes to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we want you to take communion with us. It doesn't matter what church you went to or what church you belong to. If you can say, yes, I've accepted Jesus, my Lord and Savior, take communion with us. If you haven't done that and you already took the cup, just put it in the seat in front of you. It's totally okay. Scripture tells us, though, that if you haven't declared him as Lord and Savior, it can do you more spiritual harm than good if you take communion. And so I'd encourage you to not take it. I know that sounds crazy. But if you are unsure about your relationship with Jesus, if you want to know more about that, come and talk with one of us. We would love to help you uh, to step into, into faith in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then next time we take communion, you can take communion with us. So we would love for that. Uh, but as you reflect, I want you to just take a couple of moments and I want us to have a heart of gratitude towards God. That's what we're going to look at today. The fact that he came from heaven to earth. He lived a perfect life, not for himself, but for you. So that God sees his perfect life as opposed to our imperfect life. He paid the penalty of our sins and his shed blood on the cross forever to be gone, past, present, future, never to be seen by God again. And then he was raised from the grave so that we may have eternal life. That sounds pretty generous to me. And so may we just stop and give some gratitude to God and then we'll take the elements together. If you need a communion cup, just slip a hand up and an usher will come by and help you out. God, we thank you for this time here today. God, we thank you for your great generosity of giving us your one and only son. We thank you that we have not only been forgiven and entered into eternity with you by that, but there's also a new covenant between us and you because of him, inked in his blood. We say thank you, God. May we live a life of gratitude to you. May we never take for granted what you did just because you love us so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the night uh, before Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it. And so let's break it together and then eat it. This represents the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In a similar way, he took the cup. He said, this represents my shed blood, a new covenant between you and my Father for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink together. Church, thank you so much for being here today. We love you, love you, love you. Go in peace and be blessed. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that the service today connected with you and helped you grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you have any prayer needs or simply would like somebody to reach out or come alongside you in your faith journey, please let us know by filling out our online connect card or simply emailing us at christcommunity at cccfamily.com. If this online service has blessed you in any way and you feel led to support the ministry of Christ Community Church financially, please visit our website and consider donating so we can continue to make as many resources available as possible to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that the service today connected with you and helped you grow in your relationship with Jesus. If you have any prayer needs or simply would like somebody to reach out or come alongside you in your faith journey, please let us know by filling out our online connect card or simply emailing us at christcommunity at cccfamily.com. 
If this online service has blessed you in any way and you feel led to support the ministry at Christ Community Church financially, please visit our website and consider donating so we can continue to make as many resources available as possible to reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God bless.